long time ago, different town, different place. We went to a new town, which we did a lot of <laughs> in evangelism, and I needed a haircut, which was a common thing, and so I was back to scrambling, trying to find somebody that could cut my hair. I went and found her, uh, found somebody, and she ended up doing my hair quite often because she was good. Her name was Deborah, and as we talked a little bit in that first time, uh, I kind of told her what we did and how I'd be coming in and out of town and, and stuff, and she, she said, oh, what church? And I said, Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, she said, I have always felt that Adventists have prophecy down pat. And you know, I, I, I just thought, wow, that's good. That's a good response. As Adventists, we should be thankful for our strong foundation of knowledge about prophecy. Amen? The books of Daniel and Revelation bring us hope. With a firm voice at the very end of the book, Bible, Jesus promises, I am coming soon. That's something we can look forward to. I'm assuming today that you're familiar with the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. I'm not going to go deep into proving all the different things. That's not the purpose this morning. I encourage you, if you're not, I encourage you to look up some sermons, to find some. And I encourage you, I happen to know this guy named Jack Cologne. He did this series called Revelation Now. And <laughs> they're really good. They, were, they, they are available online. You can talk with him after. He can give you a link. But um, he would, God gave him a gift for saying things clearly, easy to understand. And, and so if, if you're looking for something like that, that's a good place to look. But um, do. If you, if you don't know about these prophecies, look them up. Study them because they, they are beautiful. In the Adventist church, we consider ourselves a people of the book. But as a church, are we more like a club that has prophecy figured out? Or are we walking daily? with our Savior friend and sharing the fact that he is coming soon to our neighbor churches, our neighbors. As the end of time approaches, I believe with all my heart, we need to know and love Jesus with all of our hearts. And we need to know and understand what the Bible teaches about the end times. Today we're going to cover a familiar topic, but with a little bit of a twist. Let's open with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for all that you have given to, to us. The beautiful birds, the lovely things outside, the flowers that are blooming all over right now. And we pray that you will be with us just now as we open your word, that we can learn more about you and draw close to you. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to be focusing on Daniel 1 and 2, the first two chapters, with a few side trips to fill in some context this morning, okay? But turn to Daniel 1, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. I had to check. <laughs> verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure's, treasure house of his God. All right, right off the bat, as soon as we start reading in the book of Daniel, we hear the clarion trumpet call of what we call the great controversy. Yes, these verses give us history. They tell us when the book was written, and it's verifiable history. You can go look it up and look at these different kings and stuff, and it all happened. But they also place, they also point us to a different thing. They point us to the great controversy and to the fact 
these God, these two city nations that God used throughout all the Bible as a symbol to signify his people and the enemies of God, Jerusalem and Babylon. And it's all right there. And so as we look at this, immediately we see that we're right in the middle of it. God, I think, is getting our attention and saying, you need to be listening to this book because this book has stuff for you in it, for you and for me in these last days. Let's slip back into time and imagine this story a little bit. If you were with Daniel and his three friends, they were really just teenagers at this point in time. So often we see pictures of Daniel, he's got white hair and he's old. At this point, he's a teenager, just a teenager. And trudging in slavery on their way to Babylon, what would you have been thinking? Even, even when we face simple trials, we find ourselves wavering and wondering, where is God? Why isn't he taking care of me? I can easily imagine that they were doubting God's power. Why didn't God stop this Babylonian king from taking them captive? Why were they having to go to Babylon? These four teenagers must have been trained well by their parents perhaps anticipating this very event. Because while we don't know exactly what they were thinking, and they may have been doubting, somehow by the time they got to Babylon, they had resolved in their hearts to follow God, to stay true to what they knew. We do know, though we, even though we don't know what they were thinking, we do know how they acted, what they did while, once they were there. They were still proud and strong followers of God, never wavering in their beliefs and willing to dare or risk everything in order to stay true to their principles, to walk the daring walk. We know the story of the next few verses, nearly by heart, right? King Nebuchadnezzar asked his chief steward, his chief eunuch, some most translations say, and that is the word, to select the best of the best to be trained as his personal counselors. They would have had a first-class education in languages, literature, science, history. All of these things would have been taught to these young men. We know that a part of their indoctrination, uh, today we might even use the word brainwashing, they would have been, they, they were given new names, names that honored the local gods, not the God of heaven. And the king himself, King Nebuchadnezzar, chose and shared food from his table so that they, in, in his mind, so that they could be well nourished and enjoy the experience of a privileged court life. That's how he wanted them to live. He was, in his mind, treating them good, even though he probably turned them into eunuchs. But, <laughs> but he, he nevertheless was treating them good, wanting them to be strong and healthy. In the next few verses, we see these teenagers choosing their first battle over the subject of food. They understood they would be tempted in a lot of different ways. And they would be tempted to not believe in and trust in God. And they resolved not to do anything like worshiping another God, which most of the meat that would have been served would have been devoted to another God. They didn't want anything to do with that. And they resolved to hold fast to the dietary laws of their parents, which maybe they didn't understand the whys, but they knew they were brought up that way. They knew that they lived healthy that way. And they said, I'm going to live the way God told my parents to live. And they resolved to stay healthy 
with a clear mind, unclouded by rich food and wine that messes up the ability to think. Come on, piece of paper, I know you can do it. There we go. What about us? Let's think for a moment about our own decisions in these last days. Will we be tempted to turn away from God? I think so, most definitely. There are more and more studies that show that what goes into our bodies affects our ability to think well. And you can read all kinds of articles about strengthening your mind and your brain, especially as you get older. <laughs> and I've been reading those articles for some reason. <laughs> um, did you know that studies show they were specifically looking at whether or not people could tell right from wrong? You think we need to know that in this, these last days? I think so. They were specifically looking at that, and the studies show that one ounce of alcohol, you know how much that is? Two tablespoons, most likely, right around that. Two tablespoons of alcohol makes it hard for people to tell what's right and what's wrong. Whoa, I don't need that. One lesson that we can learn from this passage is that God wants us to guard our heart and our mind so we too can stand firm and be strong. We need to be aware of the dangers of clouding our minds. Their decision caused quite a stir. It was the king, after all, who chose their food and told them to eat it. To defy this king, any of the old pagan kings in those days, to defy them was a very dangerous thing to do. It was a risky choice. Their daring walk could mean the deaths of Ashpenaz, the head guy, his steward, and Daniel and his friends. They were making quite a decision. But they had faith that God would honor their devotion to him and that his laws of a good diet would make them strong of mind and body. They knew that it would work out that way. They had lived it all their lives, teen lives, but they had lived it. They knew that they wouldn't get sick and die. And they said, test us, and we'll be okay. And they were okay. They were walking the daring walk by faith. And God rewarded their faith and trust in his care by making them leaders in Babylon, able to guide King Nebuchadnezzar as one of his counselors instead of the counsel that came from his supposed wise men and astrologers of his day. Are we willing to be risky for God? To by faith speak up and do what is right even in the face of danger? Then we come to the classic chapter of Daniel 2. It begins in the first few verses of the chapter by telling us how King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, but he couldn't remember it. I've had that happen to me. <laughs> and usually I'm glad. I think, oh, that was a scary dream, and I'm glad I really don't remember what it was. <laughs> but the king was disturbed. He wanted to know, what did this dream mean? And so he sent for his astrologers and his sorcerers and magicians and said, tell me this dream and what it means. And when they couldn't help him, he threatened them with death. And here is where God made it clear that Bab the Babylonians' trust in all of those things, astrology, magicians, sorcerers, today we would call it New Age, fortune-telling. But God made it clear that those things were worthless. Even when threatened with death, those supposed wise men knew that they didn't have an answer. And so they basically said, even though it knew, they knew it meant their death, they basically said, well, well we can't help you. <laughs> and they knew they were sealing their fate. So the decree went out for their execution. Now, somehow, Daniel... And his friends 
weren't a part of that group, and they didn't know why they were just about to be executed. And they objected to that. They said, wait a minute, why? Why are we being executed? <laughs> I think I would object too. I can understand that. <laughs> I find the next part inspiring. Because faced with death and an angry, vengeful, frustrated king, they didn't cringe and run away. Instead, Daniel had the courage to, to, to go to the king. And even though the king had been saying, you can't have more, to all the astrologers, you guys can't have any more time to try to figure this out, Daniel had the courage to ask for more time. Can you imagine it? And yet he did it. And you know, it says something about Daniel and his friends that the king was willing to give it to them. He hadn't been willing to give it to all of his counselors, people he'd known a lot longer. But there was something in Daniel and his friends that made the king trust them, like them. And so he gave them time. And then he, Daniel and his friends had a pretty serious prayer meeting. I can imagine it. Can't you, Winter? <laughs> they did some serious praying. Notice their approach to living in a hostile environment, facing trials over and over again, was to pray, to rest and be at peace that God would take charge, and to stand firm and brave in the decision God had given them. We see those strategies, those same strategies, in the story on food in chapter 1, and in Nebuchad the story about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we see it with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. And we see it again with Daniel in the lion's den, chapter 6. These stories aren't just for kids. They're wonderful stories. We all love them. But those, the, the lessons to be learned from those stories are for all of us, even those with white hair. Do we live in a hostile environment today? You betcha. I've seen... Just in the last few days, there was a man, an elderly man, beaten up. His f whole half of his face was all bloody, eye socket broken, because he was praying outside of an abortion clinic. People have lost their jobs for talking privately to their friends about being pro-life. And teens have been kicked out of school for wearing a t-shirt that quotes the Bible and says, God created male and female. Do we live in a hostile environment? Yeah. How often do we seriously turn to God in prayer for the solutions to our problems? How often do we ask him for the strength to stand firm in the middle of whatever we're facing? It seems that God tested Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, tested them on a relatively small thing, just food. A vegetarian diet versus rich food. A simple life versus extravagance and bling. They simply chose to live a simple life because they knew they needed to be strong. God knew that they were going to go through some big tests. I, I would call a fiery furnace and a lion's den a big test. But he gave them some simple tests to, to walk through, to grow their faith, to give them courage. And in growing their faith, they were able to stand when the big things came. So what happened next? When the king was threatening to cut their heads off, what happened next? The Bible says that after their prayer, prayer meeting, they apparently went to sleep. And the king had his dream, and he couldn't sleep. They prayed because they knew they might lose their lives, and apparently they went to sleep because in Daniel 2.19, it says, During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. And that's exactly what the word means, night vision vision. Wow! These teens had the guts to stand up to a tyrant, to pray about it, to peacefully go
go to sleep knowing God was going to take care of it. And he rewarded their bravery, their prayers and faith with answers. And they are answers that still apply to us today. Help us to know more about Bible prophecy. I just looked at the clock. I got to move faster. All right. <laughs> Let's read the way. Daniel exclaimed in joy and praise to God. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. And there's a whole prayer there. I think I'm going to just read the first two verses. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. We would do well to remember that in the middle of election season. Doesn't matter really. God is in charge. I love those verses. God is in control. Even when it seems like our world is just spinning out of control, the governments, and I'm not talking just ours, but I am including ours, governments trying to impose their values and beliefs on us. And the world at war, all kinds of things going on all over the place, looking like we could end up in World War III. And in the middle of it all, God is in control. Like the song says, he's got the whole world in his hands. Amen? But surely, surely he doesn't want us to be living like this. Want us to be living in a situation of mass shootings and wars and hurricanes and droughts and floods and young people being peer pressured into drugs and fentanyl deaths and Young people being peer pressured into mutilating their God-given sex organs because they aren't happy with puberty. I bet you almost every person in this room can remember a time when you weren't happy with puberty. That's part of life. God doesn't want us to wreck ourselves like that. These things are not God's way. Now, I want to say something very important. If you're asleep, wake up, okay? Wake up the person next to you. <laughs> God does want us to love every single person who walks into our church or that we meet on the streets. Most of you know that we have a son who's trans. If by some miracle he walked through the doors of this church, I would want every one of you to hug him and love him. That's what Jesus did while he was here. He was criticized for eating with sinners. But God loved. He loves them. He loves all of us. No matter what kind of sin we're, we're struggling with. But you know Jesus ate with them spent time with them, but he also told the truth. That's the hard part. And the truth is that our son is a son, and it's difficult. That's the daring walk, to be strong for what's true. We live in a hostile environment today, no doubt about it, and it's no surprise, the prophecies tell us that before he comes to take us to live with him, there's going to be bad things going on in this whole world. Always remember the bad stuff has to happen before he can lead us into the good stuff. In order to let this tired old world come to an end, in order to prove that Satan's lies are wrong and to lead us to ultimate happiness, that's just around the corner. Sometimes we have to go through tough things. As another song says, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know who's holding my hand. He will guide us and lead us if we just rely on him. Keep holding his hand. What an amazing God we serve. Are you walking with him, serving him? Are you willing to dare and take the risk to walk in his way no matter what? He is our only strength and help. 
This is a lesson that Daniel and his friends seem to have learned before they even got to Babylon. I want their courage and bravery, their calm assurance that God is in charge. It's all through the book. We've already seen it with their diet in chapter 1 and the king's dream in chapter 2. In chapter 3 of Daniel, we see the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And again, they had amazing courage to stand in the face of threats. And I love the verse where they state their determination to follow God's way. It's in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. If we are, they're talking to the king here. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. Whoa. (laughs) Bravery. But then listen to this part. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Wow. That's what I want. That's the bravery I want. And then there's the story of Daniel and the lions in chapter 6. And even in the face of that threat... Daniel persevered in doing what he knew was right. He knew that if he prayed, he'd be in trouble. Daniel 6, verses 10 and 11. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. What was his habit? To pray three times a day. He didn't change it when it might be dangerous. He stuck to it. He hung in there. What kind of habits are you setting up in your life right now? When tough times come, will we be able to walk the daring walk? And we'll be able to do that only if we've been doing it all along. If, it, if it's a habit, it will, be, it will be able to do it. So, now, back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. What was in that dream? We know it by heart. And just in case you couldn't remember, I put it up there, all right? <laughs> he saw the statue with the gold head, the silver chest and arms, the bronze belly and thighs, the iron legs, and the feet of iron and clay all knocked down by the rock of ages and blown away like chaff, cut out but not by human hands and forming a mountain that filled the whole earth. It's here that we first find the strong march of nations, one after another. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, all of these are named and we know what they are. And then followed by the divided kingdoms, the feet of iron and clay, followed by the establishment of the Jesus kingdom, which is going to last forever. We're not going to prove the details this morning. You've already studied it, and if you haven't, go do it. But review it for yourself. In this chapter, we learn that the first kingdom is Babylon. Then in chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, we learn the next two kingdoms are Medo-Persia and Greece. The Bible tells us all of those by name. So we're not making it up. It's there in Scripture. The Bible is interpreting itself. Then the next empire is easy to figure out. That's the legs of iron. That's Rome, followed by the breakup into iron and clay, the weak and powerful nations mixing together, trying to mix. But they'll never form one strong empire again. They're going to yield to the coming of the stone which is God's kingdom. Once you have that framework, that outline, then you can easily use it to help us understand so many of the Bible prophecies. Even within Daniel, there are two more timeline prophecies that line up in a parallel fashion to help us understand it. Now we can go to that other slide because that that one shows that parallel and you may not be able to read that 
It's a little bit hard to read. But anyway, you know it by heart anyway, right? <laughs> but you can, the, the prophecies of Daniel 2 and 7 and 8 all follow each other and lay out these, these same, this same history that we have seen happen. This is why my hairdresser exclaimed about our understanding of Bible prophecy. Because when you study these prophecies, in Daniel 2 especially, it gives us a clear understanding of how this all works. One clear thing that I want you to go away with today is that these parallel prophecies show us that, that these, this march of nations is followed by the weak nation, weak and, the weak and strong mixing, and then what's next? Jesus, the stone. Jesus comes again. The second coming comes right in the end of time. And that's where we find ourselves today. In other words, there may be... Oh, I left out a piece there. Um, it says there will never again be a dominance of one empire, right? Those, that clay and iron will not mix. And different translations say it different ways, like they're not going to cleave one to another. They're not going to adhere to another. They're not, they, they will remain united, one translation says, or they'll hold, and they'll hold, they will not hold together. The next thing in all three time prophecies is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's represented by the stone, the judgment, and the cleansing of the sanctuary. Those three things all represent what's coming at the end of time. And in the stone, the judgment is the, and the cleansing of the sanctuary is the absolute wonderful beauty of prophecy because it is pointing towards Jesus coming again. Daniel 2.44, Daniel said, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Amen? I'm so glad Jesus' kingdom will be forever. Jesus is coming. In the next verse, Daniel says, The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. I'm so glad. It's sure. His kingdom will endure forever. Wow. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Jesus is going to set up a kingdom, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. John saw the same thing in Revelation, in the, and in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Let's, I'm going to pick up my Bible for that one, all right? Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Are you getting tired of pandemics? Tired of seeing friends and loved ones die. Tired of the heartache and pain. Kids transitioning, permanently altering their bodies, only to regret it a few years later. Are you tired of homeless, homelessness? Human trafficking that we see coming across the border. Abuse all around us. God is going to end all of these things. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. You know, it's interesting to me that Daniel, who walked the daring walk with the Lord himself 
by his side. In chapter 9, verse 23, it says, in most translations, it says that Daniel is greatly beloved. I like that. It reminds me of the Apostle John in the New Testament. Daniel was loved by God. That tells me they spent a lot of time together. <laughs> they knew each other. And it was this Daniel who gave us the prophecy, who received the vision, foretelling the time of the coming of the Messiah in Daniel 9.25. The anointed one, the Messiah, would come, and he would do away with sin. It was Daniel's prophecy, this guy that started out as a teenager and served different kings all through Babylon and Medo-Persia. It was that Daniel that helped the faithful believers around the time of the first advent know when Jesus would be coming. Simeon, Anna, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, even the wise men. They knew the approximate time of Jesus' coming because of a prophecy that God gave to Daniel. That's amazing. Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord of the Old Testament, who would bear our sins in his body on the tree. What an amazing, loving God we have, who walked with Daniel and his friends, stood by them in the fiery furnace, calmed the lions down. He inspired the book of Daniel and gave us the whole Bible. In fact, he calls himself the Word, the Bible. In Daniel's book, we find the most, one of the most encouraging thoughts to lift us up in today's world. There is a God who is in charge. He was with them, and he is with us now. When we face challenges to our beliefs in the hostile environments that we live in today, and we will face tough times, but we can hold his hand and walk the daring walk with him as our guide. We need to be setting those habits now, learning daily that God is with us, that he is in charge. We began in Daniel 1 with two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem, at war. Babylon took God's people captive, took them back to, the, to, to that pagan country, and it seemed as if the gods of Babylon were more powerful than the God of Israel. But that wasn't the final answer. We can read the back of the book, right? In Revelation, we again see the same two cities. Revelation chapter 18. This time, their fate is reversed. In Revelation 18, verse 21, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. God's enemies will be thrown down. Then in Revelation 21, verse 2, we already read this, but let's read it again. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And in Revelation 22, Verse 12, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. Sometimes it may seem as though, as though all is lost, but God's message is for us today. The book of Daniel is for us today. Hang on. I'm with you, and I am coming soon. I want to walk the daring walk with him with Jesus beside me, to be a part of that kingdom of stone that's going to grow through the whole world, to be with him, the one who died for me. Oh, Lord, that will be such a joyful day. And, Lord, we want your hand to wipe away the tears. We want to be done with this old world. We want to go home to be with you. And we... Just praise you and thank you that you have laid out your plan to us, that we know that that's coming soon.
Be with us the rest of this Sabbath day, that we can have a good day. For Jesus' sake, amen.